Okay, so we will continue the morning session. And uh, uh, our speaker will be uh <coughs> Professor Rabba Boukeroub from the University of Lille in the north of France. Uh, he received uh, his PhD in chemistry uh, from the University of Paul Sabatier in Toulouse. I know very well this university because I am also from this university. <laughs> and uh, is currently a CNRS research director at the Institute of uh, Electronic, Microelectronic and Nanotechnology at the University of Lille. Um, he is an uh, associate editor of the, uh, ACS, ACS Applied Materials and Interfaces. His uh, research interests are in the area of um, functional nanomaterials, surface chemistry and photophysics, yeah of semiconductors, metal nanostructures, um, with emphasis on biosensor and lab on chip applications, and also development of new tools for studying molecular dynamics in vivo. Uh, he is a co-author of uh, uh, 350 uh, research publications and wrote uh, 25 book chapters um, uh, in subjects related to nanotechnology, material chemistry and biosensor, and uh, he has eight patents, patents or patents pending. And the title of um, his talk today uh, is Nanoantibiotics, a rational design of functional nanoparticles to combat bacterial infection. Uh, good morning, everyone. Oh, that's it works, that's perfect. Thanks a, a lot, um, Anne-Marie. And first, I would like to thank the organizers for their kind invitation and also for the kind introduction. Um, so what I will try to do, I mean, in the next 30 minutes, you better stop me, otherwise I'll talk, I'll talk, I'll talk. So, but normally I have a limited number of slides, but just in case. Um, I will try to, to give you an overview of what has been or what's going on on using nanoparticles or nanotechnology for fighting against bacterial infection. And in a way, I will tell you also why this is really an important topic. But please don't be scared. I mean, at the end, it would be everything like it's a happy end, like in the American movie. So, well, first, well, um, I'm coming from the Institute of Electronics and Microelectronics and Nanotechnology. So it's mostly um, a platform for technology, like you have five in France. So this is completely the one in the north. Lily is just here. We were mostly pretty much close to at least four capital cities and Paris it's only one hour by train so it's not far away at all from here so our institute it's a lot of it's a big quite a big institute about uh, 500 people mostly engineers and technicians PhD students and postdocs and we have about 24 research groups in different areas um, such as materials and nanostructure physics micro nano technology, microsystems, optoelectronics, communications, acoustics, and instrumentation. So if you ask what we're doing there, we're a group of chemists, so we have absolutely nothing, not at least a background in, in macro technology, but um, still we can, apparently it's, there's a room for us in this institute. And now I'm telling exactly what we're doing in my group. So mostly we focus on the synthesis of nano materials, or even could be more than just nano, it could be macro scale as well. And also the chemistry, surface chemistry, we have expertise in surface chemistry, how can add a functional or onto these nanomaterials with the aim, of course, like everybody, it's different applications. If you look at the uh, bottom here, it's biosensing using optical, like SPR or localized surface plasma resonance, but electrochemistry or even analysis using desorption ionization on nanostructured materials. Uh, surface can use sponge, you know, just for environmental uh, remediation. Since we're talking about antibiotics, you know a lot of antibiotics will end up, or drugs will end up one day or the other in water. So you have also to deal with it as an environmental pollutant. So that's the issue coming here for the photocatalysis energy. And on the top, you'll see mostly the part which is mostly dedicated to biology. So there's nanoparticles with different functionalities. We do use at least for since last two years, now we're developing some, trying at least to uh, drug delivery through the skin, a transdermal delivery of, of uh, for drugs. And for that, we use the photothermal triggered um, 
um, uh, release, so using mostly graphene-based patches. So we started looking before going to the in vivo using the, um, this is the just pig ear skin because it's mostly closely related to the human skin. It's very close to that. So this we can get for free and we can have as many as you want. So at least it gives you an idea whether it's really possible or not at the first stage to make uh, or to uh, perform drug release through the skin and also we have a um, very active and, uh, and close collaboration with a colleague at the um, um, marine uh, biology in, in uh, the north of France, in Vimreux, to look exactly how these nanoparticles affect the copy pots or the aquatic uh, environment. There is one issue on the ecototoxicity, but also we deal with nanoparticles, how we can improve the uh, uh, nutritional value of this copy pot to use them further in aquaculture, okay? So, I'll start with this. I think, oh, who didn't take antibiotics? I think probably none of us. So, antibiotics certainly saved a lot of, um, I would say, lives, especially after the Second World War. It's really something which is just amazingly in the human history. But the problem is this resistance, which is more and more um, seen nowadays. And this is really problematic since the number of antibiotics is not increasing. There are not new antibi anti antibiotics on the market. So you have more resistance to the existing antibiotics, but you don't, you don't, you don't have any new antibiotics. Most of the people now trying is just to change or to modify the existing antibiotics chemically, but certainly that doesn't catch up really with the um, resistance. A little bit of history. Antibiotics comes from this, this man, so certainly you do know him. This is penicillin. So I just gave, this is for fun, I mean, you know, I, I'm not gonna keep it a long time, so it's Sir Alexander Fleming, so, he was born in Scotland, but I think the, he also was a Nobel Prize winner in physiology in 1945. He enjoyed playing soccer. What's the connection with antibiotics? There is not. Okay, so, but what's really interesting from there, you see the first antibiotic was introduced already in 1942, but only three years later, there was already a voice that maybe it would be some possible resistance. That's already just three days later. That's not very far after just being on the, on, on the market. So, but when you look afterwards, then it's almost 90% now in most hospitals. So it's already very bad for this. So, and if you can see here already um, uh, Fleming in 1945, just so you know, the time may come when penicillin can be bought by anyone in the shops. Then there's a danger that the ignorant man may easily under underdose himself and exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of drugs. That's already in 1994. So, mostly I think that's even worse. What's happening afterwards, well, not only there is the drug resistance, but also there's transfer of resistance. It means you have a resistant bacteria that can transfer to non-resistant bacteria. And this is even worse than one can expect, yeah? This is, so, this is just gives you the trend of more and more and more bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics. So probably we don't have any more left of antibiotics without having bacteria that resist to this antibiotic. So what's the reason for that? If you look, certainly over prescribing, overusing, that's the main reason, but not only. Um, you have also unnecessary antibiotics used in agriculture. This is another issue because there's antibiotics used for human, but also for farming. It's a big issue. Poor infection, hygiene, lack of proper laboratory tests, mostly this is the prevention. But it's just like electricity if you think about energy, because energy is not expensive. You leave the electricity on even you're outside the house. And it, at the end, it comes really to cultural things, to habits. It's just because we have antibiotics, we can use them, so we use them, they're cheap, so we can use them. And this is, I think, mostly the point where we have to reduce the amount and to limit this resistance. Okay, that's exactly. <laughs> Do all bugs need drugs? 
Probably not. Only the bad ones. So what I'm showing in this is uh, just you see the increase of incidence continuously. Well, the laser is almost gone, but it doesn't matter. And on B, what you see is that the number of antibiotics, new antibiotics on the market are not there. You see there are less than four in 2003, I think about three in 2007, on and almost nothing after that, okay? So you see, new drugs is declining, drug resistance is increasing. So there is something to do. And I will give you also another thing which I found nice because we're concerned mostly. If you look in France, they took Italy for two, I, th I think the two di different extremes. France for human consumption of antibiotics and Italy mostly for animals. There's certainly this big activity in, in farming or agriculture. So we're here in the red, it's about I think 30% consumption in France. So we're the most consuming antibiotics in Europe, okay? But also what surprises me when you look at Cyp Cyprus here, it's quite a small country, but you look at the red for animals, it's quite big compared to the number of population, but they use it for animals, probably they have more animals, it's okay. Yeah, and also what you see, this is just give you, uh, I think it's just in information, what you see, depending on the, on the, on the countries, you don't have the same uh, resistance to antibiotics according to the countries here. You see for the C3G in France is 28%, while for the carbapenem it's only 0.7%, while in Italy it's 25, 50%. So you, you, you do have really different, according to the countries, the resistance to different antibiotics, okay? This is in 2007, you see if you look at Earth 15 already, there was already World Health Organization call. And you if you look at the objectives, mostly is this is already good, yeah? There people are really interested in this. But what's really important is this. Yeah, education and training, the thing as I told you before, just like this energy, this is one really good thing to start with, probably it's really the important thing. But also I think this is, they're calling for investment and it's really important because we do need in indeed money for getting rid of that, putting new antibiotics on the market, but also opening for another alternatives to treat the antibacterial infection. The same in the States, you can see. And where I highlighted really the things because, yeah, you accelerate basic and applied research, it's exactly what we're doing, and also discover other therapeutics and vaccines. So there's certainly a conscious about this problem, and I put even one more, actually, I, I found it. I was reading last week, I think I must be in the train, this uh, free newspaper, uh, 20 minutes. This is in French, it doesn't matter, but exactly it says the same at the end. But this is calling for a uh, United, United Nations uh, meeting just last week. So the hope is indeed that it will be a lot of, at least, money put in this field, then we can probably go further and reach a level where we can limit this uh, antibiotic resistance. Okay, so we can start. What are the alternatives? So I will present at least two different approaches. One is based on using um, antimicrobial peptides, and the other one is based on using the existing antibiotics, but you put them on nanoparticles. So it's just this using nanotechnology for to combat this a uh, um, um, uh, antibacterial um, infection. Okay. Why antimicrobial peptides? Well, because they're part of our innate immune system and you can find them. Don't try to look at this, it's just life, a tree of life, it's always complicated. You have all the things, so you can find them almost in every class, in all classes of life. So normally you have an, an infinite number of peptides you can really access to. So, what do you expect from this anti antimicrobial peptide? This is the Swiss knife. Nowadays, you cannot bring it dead anywhere anyways. It's unfortunate. But um, at least you can develop something which is, has activity against gram-negative, but also gram-positive bacteria. Can inhibit also viruses and fungus. If you're lucky enough, probably can also apply it for cancer treatment. But hopefully also you can enhance the immunity system or can modulate that. That's what you expect exactly from this uh, 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 peptide. 
Well, as I told you, compared to the number of antibiotics, synthetic antibiotics are probably 30, maybe, I don't know, 20, 30. Here, there's absolutely not, you can imagine, whatever, it's, uh, thousands, over thousands of, of, uh, of these peptides. So, and they're natural, so you can really, you don't have any problems. So if you look at this bacterial scene, so this is an antimicrobial coming from bacteria, okay? So they're ribosomally synthesized, protein issues, non-cytotoxic. This is depends, of course, not, not all of them. As I told you, are really and nicely active against the bacteria from which or close to which they're coming from. They're st stable at really extreme pH and temperatures, and they can be produced from both gram-negative and gram-positive. So how do this work? I mean, I'm just talking about the, um, the modification of bacterial sins. So we have two different mechanisms, either pore forming or cell membrane targets. And, well, I started with this, so just to give you different classes. Again, um, I would certainly th would like to thank at this stage uh, Professor Trider because and you can find all, mostly all the, um, the, um, um, this bacteria or this anti um, microbial peptides in these two books, one in French and the other one is in English. But what you look, they're really quite very small ones, you know, bef below uh, 10 kilo delta. And the way they act, if you, like, if you, you see it's this poor forming, it means you just you have a, an insertion often of these uh, peptides in the membrane and you open a pore and that you have the internal components of the bacteria that can just, you know, be uh, uh, coming out of the pore, so that's the way it ends by the, uh, uh, the death of bacteria. The other mechanism is, yeah, it's exactly well, yeah, perfect. The other mechanism is pretty much the same, so you what you have, you have first an interaction with this um, uh, uh, proteins, and then again you have um, pore information and permeabilization of the uh, plasmic membranes. Again, you have the, uh, this leads to um, bacteria death. Uh, why I wanted to show you this, so um, we started a project um, last year on this. Uh, cholestin is something that has been used both in clinics for human and animals, but that has been abandoned for years just because it has a high toxicity, mostly ne nephrotoxicity. So that was put aside, although it's still if we're used in animal farming. And it came at, somehow, if you look, it's almost the only peptide or antibiotic that didn't show any, or they're not bacteria, that didn't show any resistance to this uh, cholestine. So then people thinking of putting back this on the market and can use it as a last resource antibiotics. So, but as I told you, it still really have this um, uh, nephrotoxicity and really high uh, side effects. So the idea behind it, what you wanted to do is if it's possible, we can potentialize the cholestine by combining it with antimicrobial peptides. So they can reduce the amount of cholestine to the level it's not any more toxic and have really a good activity. So, so you can see here the different partners involved in the project uh, funded by the National Agency. And the call is the mode of action again, it's this pore opening in the membrane. It's the same as I, I, it's, it's an, a cyclic anti, uh, ma antimicrobial peptide. But when you look, nothing is far. In 2016, it has been already discovered the first cholestine resistance gene, okay, that is carried and a plasmid and then can also transfer between bacterial strands. So this started already in 2016. So nothing is really far from anyways about resistance. But the idea here is just to combine indeed this uh, antimicrobial peptides. If we can replace cholestine, it's perfect. Otherwise we can associate that with cholestine. So having two or three different antimicrobials and on top of it, putting that on macroparticles and nanoparticles. So I'm not gonna talk about the results on this um, um, project, but mostly I'll focus now on the um, on using nanotechnology. So here what we will do mostly either develop or design a new antimicrobial nanomaterials themselves, they have an antibacterial activity, or we take 
the existing antibiotics and we put them on the nanoparticles as a carrier, drug carrier, then hoping you can overcome this drug, resist, uh, drug resistance, okay? So nano, indeed, if you look at it, you can use it both in diagnosis, in treatment, medical devices, and vaccination. So certainly you have seen a lot of uh, papers dealing with nanomaterials for um, antibacterial uh, activity. So here just a list, well, not limited, but some of it. So this part is mostly nanomaterials themselves, they have antibacterial activity. So we can use them as they are and they have antibacterial activity. I added something here, just mostly for um, titanium dioxide, is not, yeah, it's here, for zinc oxide also because they are semiconductor materials. You can also excite them with light, so we can generate reactive oxygen species. So we can add on top of it what you call uh, a photokilling effect, okay? So, but also there are so many nanocarriers here. You see liposomes mostly because they're uh, FDA approved. You have solid lipid nanoparticles, polymeric nanoparticles, dendromers, silica, and gold nanoparticles. And for gold also, it's interesting, well, we had just a talk before, because also you can use it at the same time as a photothermal agent, so we can also kill bacteria using the photothermal effects, okay? So, the mode of actions or mechanism are just, there are so many depending on the nanoparticles, depending, but mostly the one that can release ions here, mostly it's like silver or zinc, whatever, they can really act also on accepting electrons, so they can shuttle this electronic interaction and they can also then lead uh, to bacteria death. Well, if you look, this is just, I took, there are hundreds of uh, examples, so thousands of examples. Sometimes you don't learn much from the literature, but what you see, there are a lot of materials, but some of them are already at the clinical stage. So there's definitely hope for that, and there's probably a big potential of using nanoparticles for antibacterial activity. You see, uh, chitosan itself is really nice because it has antibacterial activity, but also you can associate that with uh, different uh, nanomaterials. Those are the type of nanomaterials that have themselves antibacterial activity. But here also, you see, you can go, even some are marketed here, clinical trial marketed. So there are some on the market, but this is probably two, three years ago, probably even, even more on the market. So the message behind, yes, you can use either nanomaterials as antibiot antibiotic uh, themselves, but also you can carry the existing drugs using nanoparticles, okay? Yeah, th this, there's no point to, to, to give the, 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 the whole list. So. so from there, what you do learn, of course, if everything is nice, nanotechnology offers a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of disadvantages or at least limitations or hurdles one has to really to come over or to understand. So if you look at the antimicrobial nanoparticles, the advantages, so targeted drug delivery, we have specific accumulation. This has to be certainly demonstrated whether you have like EPR effect or not at the infected sites with bacteria as you would have, for example, for um, um, cancer cells. This is not really clearly understood. So, so what does that mean? It means then you have to target all the time. Whenever you use nanoparticles, you have to add a target molecule. Then they complicate the, 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 the synthesis and the, 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 the whole system to be put all together. But still, well, what you have really a lot of advantages comp compared to the free antimicrobial, and the most important because we're looking at is really this overcoming the resistance. Um, but also you have what you call certainly disadvantages compared to the, um, uh, the free drug. Well, I, if you want, I can give you all this time. I mean, there's no point to go all through. So I will show you some examples we have been um, working on using another approach. Instead of using antibiotics, we use nanoparticles modified with sugars. And the reason for that, and this is for your urinary, urinary tract infections. So when you look at the cell, when it's, it's, it's the initial stage before it gets infected by bacteria or even viruses, there is an interaction. That's the first thing that happens between the bacteria or the virus with the cell, the host cell. And this interaction often is mediated by sugar protein interaction. Okay, 
So what we tried, I said, well, okay, we can fake this or disrupt this or inhibit this interaction by putting sugars on the neural particles. And indeed, if you do that, it works. So we can inhibit completely this infection or with viruses also, it works very nicely. So then, well, in this case, we took diamond nanoparticles. It works better than other nanoparticles like silica, iron oxide, why? Because the structure is not the same, but it's again, this is comes all to these nanoparticles, depending who made them, who, how you modify them, how they look like, the shape and size, quite a lot of things involved. But what you wanted to see as well, whether we can inhibit biofilm formation using this uh, modify nanoparticles. And indeed, you can inhibit a biofilm before formation, but when it's formed and mature, you cannot destroy it using these nanoparticles. Then you probably have to add something else. So I will just show you some uh, images on that. So this is just the fimbriae of, uh, well, the fimbriated bacteria. So if you use nanodiamond that have been modified with galactose, you see there's no interaction with the, the fimbriae. There's absolutely no, so it's really specific to a sugar. It's not just any sugar, okay? However, if you use this mannose, you see now there's really very nice interaction of this mannose coming around the bacteria, okay? We then look at um, um, mantle. You have all your chewing gum, which is very cheap. And well, it has some antibacterial, but at a very high concentration, the uh, minimum inhibitory concentration are quite high. So also, we can modify the, the, the mantle and again put it as nano diamond. Can we really use that uh, as an antibiotic for or inhibit biofilm formation? And it turns yes. You can see it is really comparable to ampicillin for SROs, but if you take E. coli, it works even better at slightly higher concentration. So there, I think, different ways, just using antibiotics, you can use really simple molecules to also design anti-bacterial um, um, uh, material. Then I think you have certainly, well, have the uh, nice and long talk on this, uh, uh, photothermal heating. And the idea here is just using this near-infrared where most of the bio molecules would not absorb, so this is, at least you don't damage the bio, uh, biological matter, so here we started well with um, uh, gold nano rods just to have this plasmonic band here in the near infrared. Well, the, the, um, so what we did, we even on top of that, we put a few layers of graphene on top of this uh, gold nano rod, as you just see it's a TM image, and this is below 10 nanometers, this graphene layer. So what you do with that, you just improve the absorption and also the efficiency in the thermal heating. And graphene, you can easily functionalize that. You can absorb through absorption or through different means. You can really easily load a lot of drugs on it, a high amount of drug on it. So that's the reason we use this graphene. And when you look, you can really uh, heat, well, this is just water, but you can really, with this material, when you have this pegulated, just to have better dispersibility, you can heat up to 70 degrees C almost very easily. Then, well, this is just, it doesn't matter really the, um, the chemistry, but what's nice here is just you can see, yeah, it's the dispersion. When you have this pegylated, it's really nice. You can, it's really stable for ages. There is no, in general, it's pretty much, there's not a such a big difference in the absorption when you have this, um, uh, graphing on top of it, but now what you see, you see, you can really nicely eradicate uh, this UTI 89, which are quite strong, by using about 40 microgram per mL of this um, uh, material and heating at 8 watts per centimeter. It works very nicely. More than that, what you can do, and uh, I think soon I'm coming to the end of my talk, we used again this manos, but this time it's like a small uh, three different molecules with these chains, because to increase an, uh, the, uh, the, um, the targeting. And indeed, when you modify this graphene layer with this just through adsorption, what you see, if we take this um, uh, um, uh, bacteria 
and this is just uh, is expressing fluorescence. It's fluorescent labeled, but you will also labeled the uh, the nanomaterial with uh, FITC, FTIC. And what you see when you merge them, definitely there is a, a close contact between the gold nanoparticles and this uh, bacteria. However, if you take another strain, then you don't have at, at all this interaction. So you can really target. And you can kill one. Look here, you can kill this type, but not this type, you see. And so you can really have a targeting by just using a simple um, sugar um, material. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, well, microbes will have to the last world whatever you do. Well, hopefully, but at least still, we can do a lot of things with um, these nanomaterials, especially either directly by using as a carriers, also by combining the different magnetic or thermal, photothermal or magnetothermal properties. However, still, you know, th this is always the problem with nanoparticles. You have such a huge and diversity of nanoparticles. There are some issues related with the long-term stability, biocompatibility, toxicity. Where do they end when you put this antibiotic? Where is the biodistribution? So this is still, do we need it to target these nanoparticles to the get them really to the infected site? Or we do have other effects such as EPR then they will just accumulate, that will save certainly a lot of things. Also, the synthesis the highest um, of the mass production of nanoparticles is always variation from one batch to the other, from lab to the other. So these are all the things that we need really to also high throughput technology to which nanoparticle I use, the composition, the shape, the surface chemistry. So there are a lot of certainly uh, challenges left, but also the in vivo, so far a lot of, uh, of these experiments were uh, performed in vitro. So this has to be really done almost systematically in vivo to check whether there is a possibility or not to use na this nanomaterial. And at the end, I think, again, it's still, we cannot stop really the, the, the synthesis or, uh, of new drugs. So definitely it has also to catch up with coming up with new drugs for um, uh, combating this um, um, antibacterial resistance. Um, I just finish up by thanking the people. I didn't put everyone, doesn't matter, from my group, but also the fundings. It happens mostly, yeah, we have pathogens and graphene from RISE, but also from the ANER on this antibiotics, although this is probably not the what we do the most in the lab, but that's where we get funding, so why not? Uh, this I would just put here and end up here. We just, it's always nice when we start in the new fields, we wanted really to, to put together a lot of, uh, some experts in the field on the different aspects of using nanomaterials for antibacterial, uh, or for management of microbial infections. We'll, we do learn a lot just by editing this book and also review article again on, on graphene. It comes as a new material, but also with the advantage of you having a high surface area and easy functionalization, so we can really load a lot of material on it. So it's really promising, although it's not the only material. You have also uh, carbon dots, which are there, as well as a new material for um, in, in this area. So. Um, have yet some at the end of my talk. I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer if you have any questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Don't flood yourselves. So I was wondering that why are the, you know, is it the type of the sugar that you bound to the nanoparticles that, that made it more attractive? Yeah, yeah. Or uh, also, the second thing is that um, what if they have already bound to the, uh, to the plasma membrane? Then if we put the nanoparticles with these sugars, will it uh, overcome that competitive binding? You're right, especially when it comes to the um, uh, lectin uh, sugar interaction. It's not a strong interaction. So definitely that's not... It's specific, but even it's specific, it's not like, you know, antibody antigen interaction. It's not very specific. So we will have always indeed a um, occurrence of other interactions, so it's not that specific. So what we do, that's the reason why we used, um, where is the, yeah. So we're hoping you can have a cooperative effect. If you put more of the sugars, then you can increase the affinity. So that's the reason it's not anything else. But definitely the lactin sugar interaction is not the <laughs> most, yeah. High affinity interaction, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good point, yeah. Thank you. Another question? Yes, here. 
regarding your uh, strategy, no. how to treat this uh, my, uh, anti microbial. Um, what do you think uh, regarding the mechanism? The silver nanoparticles are the major players, or silver ions are the major players in this uh, uh, world of uh, yeah. antimicrobial? This is one question. The second one is uh, you said something about nanomaterials, and on another column you said about nanoparticles. Now, silver nanoparticles were in both columns. Uh, can you tell us your strategy, how to manipulate the nanomaterials and particularly nanoparticles in this? Let's start with uh, the last. Well, and we, we finally, definitely we do expect to get from the peptides themselves to increase, to increase the, system because it appears the, to the, uh, the immune system. Well, but this has to be demonstrated and also has to be probably proven. So I don't know which antimicrobial peptide will have this uh, immune uh, system. Uh, for silver, yes. Silver is known for ages, but still, it's really used for mostly for coatings. It's in the hospitals, it's not really used for um, uh, other means. Silver ions, yes, are playing the game. If you take silver, right away it will oxidize to silver oxide. That's the first thing when you put silver in, in, uh, in any buffer solution of water. That's the first thing, it will oxidize. And also could be corroded, so you will, you will certainly release, and it is silver plus that plays the antibacterial role. Certainly. Um, if you talk then about this, I put gold nanoparticles. I didn't put silver. On the second row, I put gold, not silver. If it's this, yeah. No, mostly for as a carrier, you don't use silver nanoparticles. It's because you said something about aluminum nanoparticles. So we know that aluminum is a, uh, a uh, Alzheimer uh, disease trigger. Then how? Uh, but but it's not Can you yeah, tell us your concept? Because no, they mostly are used for for coatings. They are mostly for in hospital for coatings. It's not really for in vivo studies. Yeah, most of this metal metal oxide. Yes. Uh, I don't think they would be used for something, especially if you take, yeah, you see aluminum or copper. Copper is very cytotoxic. Copper 2 plus is really cytotoxic. This is more for like, a, yeah, for, for material coatings. Yeah. Or wound healing, or, but I don't think they will be used for other means for in vivo. So one of the one you uh, When you come to graphenes, right. so I mean, do you feel our, uh, it's a pretty much worked area? We do not work, of course. But what about the toxicity aspects of graphene derivatives? So they cause, uh, say, they use redox difference in the normal cells. Also. Yes, this is. Yeah, yeah. Is. Graphene, yeah. If, if you, it's again it depends what's the source of the graphene, the graphite material. So you have contamination, metal contamination. So you have to remove. You know, like carbon nanotubes. It's known at least because you grow them. It's a catalytic growth. You have also metal. Contamination from graphene is the same. So, graphene for biomedical application, yes, it has to be really carefully chosen. So, we have the source, if you buy them uh, nowadays, you can gra buy graphene oxide from different sources. Definitely, they don't have the same uh, biological properties, they don't have the same behaviors, they don't have the same functional groups. So, th this indeed, you cannot be one graphene for, yeah, it, they are graphenes. And in a way, you have to make probably your graphene, then you characterize it nicely, you know exactly what's on the surface, the different functional materials, you know the, the sp2 carbon, how many uh, sp2 carbon you have versus sp3, CO. Yes, this is, this is not a single graphene, they are graphenes, unfortunately. Yeah. You cannot buy the same graphene from one day to the other, from one company to the other. So it opens, yes, indeed, a lot of questions then, yeah. Okay, good. So last question. Yeah, very nice talk. Uh, just a question regarding the uh, resistance phenomena. Yeah. I'm just curious, do, do you think that uh, uh, we can enhance the uh, resistance phenomena by using the nanomaterials and nanoparticles? Is it, it a risk or uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, no, the risk, in it is, well, the, the um, um, you can enhance indeed, you don't have, no, enhancing, no. You improve the, the resistance. Uh, uh, you No. When you use nanoparticles loaded with antibiotics, then you don't have the problem of resistance. Okay. There are issues related to that then. As, as well, you inject nanoparticles. Would they go to where the bacteria is? Or you have biodistribution everywhere? That's an issue. 
And this, it comes to understand exactly the infected sites, whether that's, there are not so many in vivo experiments, whether indeed if you like, you have this EPR effect, if you inject a nanoparticle, would that go exactly to the infected site? Then I would say then you gain a lot because you reduce the amount of the antibiotic, you don't have the problem of resistance. You can associate also a phototherm'al effect or photodynamic effect. But otherwise, yes, it's problematic. The problem of, of uh, the, uh, what's happened to the particles, it is there, definitely, yeah. Okay, thank you very Thanks. much. If you thank have you. other questions, you will have the poster session uh, this afternoon to, to ask. Thank you very much. Thanks.